Steve Oliver. I've been trying to get an interview with you for I don't know how long. But first of all, I'd just like to tell some of the younger viewers a little bit about your, your background or, or your dad's background because uh, when I was growing up in a little town in Riverton, um, your dad was a household name. He was the Arnold Schwarzenegger of New Zealand. You know, I think 10, ten years in a row, the... the um, New Zealand what, champion. New, yeah. Yeah, what? New Zealand heavyweight champion, 10 years uh, running. Yeah, he went to uh, three Olympics. Won a gold at um, Commonwealth Games. Yeah, and uh, yeah, numerous other achievements, you know. But um, yeah, just, you know, he's a real driven driven man and yeah. I just grew up in that kind of environment so. Yeah because he wasn't a, only a great competitor because he's uh, one of the most successful Commonwealth Games coaches that we've ever had as well wasn't he? Yeah he coached the team I mean he you know he obviously started up the gyms and then started up a barbell factory he could you know just uh, producing weights and stuff which went around the world you know it yeah. exploded at the time. Um, yeah, I mean, he's seen the opportunity, you know, it was a sport just starting out, you know, so he jumped on it and, you know, opened a few gyms around and it was basically him and Les Mills. And Les Mills was his best man at his wedding, so they were very tight, you know. Him, Precious McKenzie, you know, Clive Green, all these guys used to be like uncles, you know, they used to come around. It was a very, quite a tight knit, you know, um, click that they had going on there. and. Yeah, so it was a great time to grow up, you know. Yeah, so you, you've you been around gyms all your life. Yeah, yeah. he he uh, started out West Auckland in um, Glen Eden and then um, he moved into Newland just across the road. He had another gym and then St Luke's and out south he had another one. But um, yeah, he, you know, he was super driven and um, very focused so, you know, he went from lifting, very, you know, taking it very seriously and doing his thing with the lifting into, into business, you know, and uh, kept his drive going and, and on the business. But, um, yeah, he'd he done good things, but it was, you know, early in the days and things have changed a lot now. So um, yeah. but Sometimes, you know, you get children from um, top athletes or that, they, sometimes they're put off by that. Yeah. But you weren't, you followed on the footsteps yeah, and you were a national champ by the time you were in the secondary school. Yeah, I mean, he started wrestling. He started wrestling and then started uh, lifting to get strong for wrestling. And then, you know, dropped off the wrestling and, and kept going on to the, to the lifting. And, um, you know, he was brought up in a, in a, you know, his dad was a boxer. So he'd grown up around it. And um, yeah, I mean, just a very competitive family. My other uncle, his his brother was a competitive uh, long distance runner, you know, like just totally extreme opposites, you know. His uh, dad was, a, you know, a lifter and the, and the other uncle was a long distance runner. And then we had, a, you know, his other uncle, or my other uncle, his younger brother was an international tennis player, you know, really driven on tennis. And then and the other one was an international golf player. So there was a real mix. Wow. But all the boys were, you know, very driven. And, you know, my uncle, he, he was the youngest out of the lot and he was he would just bash a tennis ball, you know, tennis ball against and practice his hits against the next door neighbour's uh, brick wall and, and, and until the brick wall fell in, you know, he was that persistent that he actually caved the brick wall in with just the tennis hits. But, you yeah, know, they, they're all driven, you know, and um, it, uh, it's good and bad. <laughs> but uh, no, they're good, good guys and done, done well for themselves. But I mean, um, I lived in West Auckland at, at the gym on site. I was born there, and um, and that's how we grew up. We grew up in the gym, and I'd go to school, and then come straight home from school, straight into the gym floor, and hang around with the boys. And you know, it was a, it was a great childhood. You know, uh, I'd stay there until dark, until I was told to come home, and you know, that's how I grew up around, just around sports and around competition. Right. You, your weightlifting, you um, were a national champ mm. and um, did some pretty pretty awesome weights yeah, when you were young. Started, I started wrestling, you know, Dad got me into wrestling when I was, uh, you know, just going into intermediate. 
and uh, then right through into high school I went to Kelston Boys, a local high school and um, and from there then I got into weights, so I started weights very young and then went into wrestling and then come back to the weights uh, and got competitive into the uh, powerlifting, you know, I wanted to do something different to that, he was an Olympic lifter and so I got into powerlifting, it was squats, bench press and deadlift, so I got into that, <coughs> raised me young, about 14 or 15 and yeah, and just persisted and stayed, re you know, stayed, uh, you know, just turning up regularly and and dedicated myself to that until I was out of the, the junior division, which was 22 years old. But I got, uh, I took, I was the first Kiwi ever to medal as a junior in the in the world champs. Um, I took uh, second biggest bench in the world in '93, I think it was, and uh, yeah, took third overall. So I had a reasonably good result as a junior. But then I got bored with it, you know. I, uh, it's been doing the weights and I was getting large, you know. I didn't want to, I knew it was unhealthy. My fitness was non-existent. So I moved over and just after 23, I wanted to do something that was going to be a hobby, you know, because I was so extreme into the lifting. I wanted to take it easy and just have some a hobby that would keep me fit. And I just thought martial arts would be the one. And then I seen, uh, uh, one of the first MMA fights with Health Gracie and uh, I thought man that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu looks like the one you know uh, so I looked around and there was no one but then just happened to be that uh, a Brazilian turned up like you know within weeks of me looking around and I started up with him a guy named Dolfo Collar a black belt under Hicks and Gracie and uh, yeah there was you know the old school boys is uh, Carl Weber and Martin Brown and all the you know, old boys there and when I first turned up and we stayed with him for just under a year and then he moved away and then I just said, well, what do I do, you know, I mean, there's no one else. He said, oh, if you're serious, go and see this guy, Hicks and Gracie. He's, uh, he's the man, so. Where was he? He was in LA, yeah, so I just, I was enjoying it, so I moved over, you know, moved over to LA and there was no internet back then, so I just turned up and yeah, it's uh, some interesting times, you know, I um, I just got a little place, a little, uh, sort of like a little um, room right next to the airport, and I didn't know, but it was the, like the hood of LA, it was, it was called Englewood, you know, and um, I didn't know really where, where the academy was from that, so I took, you know, just started catching buses and managed to find the academy, and I was going backwards and forwards, I took it two or three buses to get to the academy. But I was happy where I was staying, and then, um, but everyone, you know, I just no one knew who I was. I, I turned up, and there was a, I was, you know, reasonably large at the time, so I, was, I was a target straight away. And I rolled with a guy named uh, just a little Asian guy, you know, and I thought, oh, this guy's not going to be too much problem, you know. And he popped the first first roll, he popped my arm, you know, popped my arm. And I was just okay. He's better than I thought he was, but so I better pick my game up, you know. He won't happen again. Boom! He popped the second arm. So first roll, I got both my arms popped, and uh, I just, you know, trying to make a connection there, but they all thought I was an undercover cop, and I was out for a couple of weeks with my arms, and I just sit and watch, you know, and then um, I was just asking the boys, hey, if there's any work going, you know, hook me up with some work, and Henry was on the door, and he just said, hey, you know, one night after a couple of weeks, he said, we're short one, do you want to jump in, you know? So I jumped in, and uh, it was a punk uh, festival, and it just, kicked off <laughs> so uh, I'd done a you know a reasonable job and they just said man if you want to work you've got a job you know so I uh, that's yeah there was the start of a good relationship I'm still you know very good friends with Henry and I basically slept on his couch for 10 years over there I used to come and go backwards and forwards to New Zealand and back again but um, yeah great great friend and helped me out you know the first day he dropped me back at the trailer park he just said mate, grab your shit, we're out of here, you know, because it was, <laughs> you know, later on I realised where I was staying, it wasn't, you know, definitely it wasn't, wasn't it definitely wasn't Parnell, so uh, we moved over to his apartment and uh, got on with it, you know, some of the best years of my life, working and training and competing over there with the boys, but, um, yeah. And, and that's where you, um, you, you won your titles over there? Yeah, we just we competed a lot, you know, we competed a lot. There was no real opportunity like there is now, you know. Um, 
just any competition we could jump in, you know. And uh, you know, it was early in the days. I didn't even know who Hickson was. I just knew he was good, you know. So I, you know, it's not until later on that you realise he's, you know, he's the man. But you know, there was the likes of um, Dave Camarillo used to come down because Health Gracie's was up in San, uh, San Francisco. They used to come down on the weekends and just you know, love training with Hickson. So there was guys coming and going all the time. With Dave, there was uh, BJ Penn. You know, BJ Penn was up in uh, San Diego and come down on the weekends and they'd sleep in the, in the lounge with me, you know, before the, these guys were anything, you know. But um, no, I met, you know, all the Gracies, um, they all coming and going and met Aloe Gracie many times. And yeah, it's, it's awesome looking back, you know. Mm. And is that where the um, association with the American top team is originated bit, from? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'd always heard that uh, Ricardo Laborio was the man. And it wasn't until later on that we really uh, connected through Mark, actually. You know, later on, and like I, you know, started working with Mark in about 2003, I think. And uh, just there wasn't much sparring around in Oceania at the time, you know, as far as MMA. So we. Uh, I can reached I, out. Can I just ask you, what mm. year you come back to New Zealand and see that? Uh, New Zealand? Zealand, I came back, I got my black belt, I think it was 212, 211. I came back just straight after. And I could see because before that I was looking at the tournaments and the tournaments weren't that busy. And, you know, when I got my black belt, I <coughs> came home and the tournament had a, a few people in it. So I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe now's the time to come home. You know what I mean? But, um, yeah, you know, through Mark with the sparring at the American Top Team, I uh, connected with R uh, Ricardo and just a just a real great guy, you know, on all levels, you know, an animal off on the mat and a, just a total gentleman off the mat, you know. Um, yeah, I, I just really clicked with him and and the relationship formed out of out of uh, those you know those trips. But um, you know, I mean, when I was at uh, Hickson's there was a tight, really tight crew because we were <coughs> all kicking around the same age. It was me, Henry Aikens, a guy called Shane Rice, which was a Canadian guy, very good, uh, and Hox and Gracie. So there was about four or five of us that would hang out every day and train and, you know, work together and, yeah, it was, it was good times. Living but the um, dream. Yeah, living the dream, you know. I got uh, one of my best achievements as a jiu-jitsu, I, I took a, I was the first Kiwi to take a IBJJF world title. At 2009? Yeah, I took that as a brown belt. So, um, yeah, that was, you know, it was a big achievement, but it took me, you know, uh, 17 years to achieve my black belt, you know, um, and I, I honestly, I never stopped training, you know. Uh, if I was injured, I'd go to, to, to class and watch. You know, in the, in the States, in the States I was catching three buses. I'd come in at 10 a.m., I'd uh, train, then I'd wait for an hour, because it would be 10 to 11, I'd wait for an hour, then I'd train again from uh, 12 to 1.30. And then there was a, um, there was a fast food place, it was called uh, Jack in the Box, I think, at the time, a burger, burger place. So I'd stay in Jack in the Box and, and just write up my notes, you know, my training, you know, what we'd gone over and stuff. And then I'd wait there till 4.30 and then uh, help with the kids' classes and then train again till 9 and then catch three buses home, you know. And um, I'd say some of your dad's dedication has rubbed off on you. Yeah, I mean, just you get something in your head, you know, yeah. you just can't get it out, you know. So until the job's done, yeah, it was, a, it was a long road, but man, I wouldn't change a thing, you know. Met some great people and, you know, learned a lot of lessons. I mean, I was extremely strong. Um, and I know that if I'd stay, you know, I was asthmatic. That was almost a blessing. I was so strong that I could, I'd just move people around, you know, and it would, technique wouldn't have anything to do with it. So, but after three or four minutes, my lungs would kick in and I'd be weak as a kitten, you know what I mean? So I had to learn te technique, you know, and I've been, uh, you know, complimented many times about for my size, I'm very technical, and I, and I recommend to everybody to train when they're tired, you know. You know, you get a lot of strong guys now, you know, rugby guys come in strong, fit, and they never learn how to be technical, unless they're going to train tired, you know. And that's a golden rule that I learned early, was to train tired, you know, and then, you know, it's all about survival. Okay, if I move, you know, 
half, a, you know, five mils to the side, I can breathe now, I can survive, you know, because there's no toilet breaks. You know, with Hicks and Gracie watching you, you're not, you're not calling hey time or giving up and walking off the mat. It's, it's done when, it, when he sees it's done, you know, so I had to learn how to survive. I could be having a full blown asthma attack and just have to stay and, and, and learn how to not die. <laughs> and uh, through that, I got very technical for my size, so it was a blessing. But um, yeah, good times over there. Over there, I mean, uh, you know, I moved after, you know, Hoxon unfortunately passed away at a young age and uh, really blew the club apart, you know, in, uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, I talked to the boys and with their blessing, I, I moved to um, Gracie Baja in Sydney. And I spent the rest of my time there training under Marcelo Hizengi uh, over there. You know, very technical. Uh, yeah, just in a you know great team I formed over there as well. So I was there for up to I think five, six years. And then I got my black belt and moved home. But that's where I met Mark in uh, in Sydney. Mark, Hunt, yeah. yeah, you know. And, and was Mark in? When did he shift to MMA? He won the title, I think it was one, uh, 201 or 202, won the K1 World title. Yeah. And then he um, he didn't like the scene and didn't like a few of the people in the scene and wanted to mix it up and see the MMA was on the rise and wanted to have a crack, you know. He said it suited his style better anyway. But it was a long process. I mean, uh, <coughs> I can remember some of the, you know, the first time I met him was actually over here. He came home and a, a mutual friend, Brendan Mackey, he's a black belt under me, he said, organized a bit of a training and, and Mark was going to go into this MMA fight in, uh, in Japan, big deal, pride, and never, you know, he's all he's done is uh, kickboxing and never wrestled, you know, so he, Brendan said you need to come and feel this, you know, so he turned up and he was a unit, he was about 135 kilos and, you know, K1 world champion, you know, so he was serious and uh, I thought, well, Okay, who's going to show this guy how vulnerable he is on the takedown, you know? And I looked around, it was just me, so I was like, okay, let's go, let's do it, you know? And um, really exposed him, you know, and, and put him down at will at the start, you know? Low singles and stuff like that. And he was just open and he couldn't believe it, you know? And we put, the, we put a bit of hurt on him, you know? Just to let him know that he was vulnerable, you know? Because yeah. it's the only way guys, uh, you know, me included, I mean, if I'd had an easy training the first day I turned up, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it so much, you know, but... Uh, the challenge. Of yeah, the challenge, you know, and uh, so we exposed him and then he fell in love with jiu-jitsu and we kicked off a yeah, 10 or 12 year relationship, you know, work in his corner and pride, you know, right with uh, through um, <coughs> Vandalay Silver and Fido Alamenko and I've worked this corner against all those guys, you know, the, you know, some of the best experiences of my life, you know, working with Mark, and he's a talented man and great guy, and yeah, yeah, there some really good times there. But through, you know, a, a guy came over, um, Jeff Monson, another big unit, you know, and uh, he came over for an MMA fight over here, early, extreme MMA or extreme, I can't, some show they put on over here, and um, I was back, uh, Back from the states, and he was here, and he was looking around for rolling, and no one wanted to roll. I was like, bro, I, man, I travel for this, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll take, I've got to take up this opportunity. So I was rolling with him, but he was on a different time slot. So he was ringing me up at one o'clock in the morning to roll in town, you know. So okay, let's do it, you know. So we're rolling, and he really evolved my game in, in, a, in a certain aspect. And um, I went on from training with him for six weeks, and then that's when I won worlds. Was maybe you know, three months later. And I attribute to a lot of the work that I'd done with him, you know, it was a uh, perfect build up. So uh, through him, I made the connection to Ricardo and the American top team. And we went over there and done our thing. And, you know, that was really the turning point in Mark's career too, when we went to American top team. I mean, everyone, you know, jujitsu guys, it's, you know, it, it is what it is. They think it, that the MMA fight is just jujitsu with hands. It's not, you know, it's a totally different beast so back in the day we went over there and basically just you know I, I talked to Ricardo and I just said man what's the difference you know show me the difference so he put in a, you know a lot of work with us and um, yeah really fine-tuned us on the on the effectiveness of distance and you know just the basic 
fundamental differences between Jiu Jitsu and MMA. So um, yeah, from there, Mark really his career took off. You know, yeah, he um, at one stage he had the best uh, stand up take down defense in the UFC. You know, by a long shot. You know, so yeah, he really from there he really started to go well. You know, it was a great time, but. Um, you know, then we formed uh, America, uh, New Zealand top team here in um, 2016. <coughs> it's a consortium of maybe 16 clubs na uh, nationwide. And uh, the boys are doing great things. You know, we just locally, we took in this club alone, we took uh, five world titles last year, just in jiu-jitsu. And, um, you know, we've got a great wrestling coach here, Kareem. An Iranian, one of the best wrestling coaches I've ever seen, probably the best. He's not only very technical but passionate, you know. I mean, he got married on his marriage day, he came to the training between, he was supposed to be taking photo shoots, he came and trained the boys and then took off to the reception, you know. Just super dedicated, you know, and great guy, and he's a big part of the team, and yeah, we just. We, you know, we build it from the from the ground. You know, those guys, the kids walking in here at four years old, and we build them right through. We've got a great program and and curriculum and structured pathways for these guys. Now we've got guys like B, you know, uh, uh, JJ. You know, yeah, doing great things in Bellator, and you know, I've got a great network in the states where if these guys really flourish here, we can send them over and get them a bit of international experience, still with a family environment, and. Um, no, it's exciting, mate. Yeah, really exciting. The future's in great hands with these young kids. So, <clears throat> yeah, we just got to, you know, I just, I never had any opportunities. You know, I had to take whatever I got. Um, but now, you know, we can, thankfully, you know, with the networks we've created and, and the facilities we're able to give these kids, you know, they're doing good things. And, and you know, we bring over with the New Zealand Top Team Network, we bring over you know, Ricardo's coming over in March. Uh, we had uh, Bruno Malfacini, 10-time world champion, come over in the last year. I mean, we've had Dave Camarillo, we had, you know, we've had them all. So we bring them over t two times a year, to, you know, and um, expose these guys, even if they don't have the money to move offshore, expose these guys to a world-class, you know, coach. And, you know, it's been a program that we've been running for years, and it's really starting to pay off, these guys. <clears throat> the ones that can afford have been going overseas, but now the trips are, uh, uh, it looks like the trips need to be less and less because we're building up such a high level of training partner here. Come you, and watch you, yeah, yeah, well, you know, just the training, you know, the, the, the boys here, there's a real uh, core group of guys that are world class, you know, so they don't, you know, not the individual doesn't have to go over and to get exposed to training, high level training partners. The training partners are now in New Zealand, you know which is um, massive, you know, it really is for the country. And, you know, I can see, you know, our demographic over here, we're built, you know, we're warriors, you know what I mean? Uh, we're uh, Māori, Pacific Island, mix <coughs> with Pākehā, and I think it's just a, ma a great mix, you know, and uh, you just see guys turning up daily that are just world-class potential, you know, and it just really comes down to individuals uh, work ethic, you know, and um, that that that's the that's the one you're looking for is the one that is willing to keep walking forward, you know. And uh, you know, it's uh, you, you're very strong on a, on a team bonding too. Yeah, like it's like a family here. Yeah, it is, man. I mean, without a team, you got nothing, you know. what I mean, and um, it's a bit unfortunate the way the UFC's been going in, in in the last few years. It's all about talking smack and being disrespectful and bouncing around with teams and it just goes against everything that the martial arts stands for, you know what I mean? There's family and honour and respect and loyalty, it's just, um, you know, it is what it is. So, you know, we just stay true to our roots and, and you know, we, our, you know we, we're a mixed martial arts gym, we've got, you know, different disciplines with wrestling, kickboxing, jiu-jitsu, MMA, but we really stay true to our core uh, our core discipline, which is jiu-jitsu here. So um, it's a great base for, for all the martial arts to come off, especially, you know, the MMA and stuff. So, no, it's uh, exciting times, mate. And the future of the, the country's in great hands with these youngsters, you know? It really is. Mm.
and um, I was talking to, I did an interview with Vahid uh, yeah. a little while, and he said you've been a great supporter of his right through, and that <coughs> you're actually going to be doing some work with yeah, him. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's a great guy, and you know, he's got the, uh, you know, the growth of New Zealand. Uh, he, he wants to really see New Zealand do well. And um, yeah, I've been working with Vahid for a long time. He's been, he's a student of mine. And, you know, he's started up in town and I'm in there supporting him in there. We're just about, I mean, we're starting up a uh, NZQA school in there where the, 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 the kids can come and do uh, their theory, but their hours on the mat actually go towards their degree. So it's really exciting, you know, the kids can train almost a degree in Jiu Jitsu while, you know, getting a three or four, a level three and four in uh, security work or um, PT. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting what's going on in there. And um, he's secured a World Cup for this year for New Zealand. I mean, you know, it's just a massive opportunity for New Zealanders to get in there and have a crack. I mean, there's an international title. I think it's happening in, in July. And then uh, a World Cup in November. So, you know, the first time I've ever heard of a World Cup being brought home. Most, most of the time we've got to travel halfway around the world and we're at the mercy of the selectors to, to, to choose our draws and everything like that. We're here on home ground uh, fighting for a world title, you know what I mean? And, um, man, it's, yeah, I think it's huge for the country. I think it's, you know, a real opportunity for the Kiwis to get in and get behind it. Mm. Exciting times ahead. It is, mate, yeah. It just seems like, you know, every year is getting better and better, you know. The tournament circuit, we run the New Zealand uh, NZ Grappler, and that's been going from strength to strength over the years. We've uh, now we're going into the South Island this year, two in the South Island. So, yeah, it's exciting times, mate. It's busy times, but um, <laughs> but great for the sport, you know. Well, it sounds like you're not scared of hard work anyway. No, oh, we just got to do it, mate. Eh? You know, now's the time. We get it done, and hopefully the rewards will be there in the in the long term, you know. But we can just see it, you know, really come into fruition, and the and the kids here and you know, the program's proving itself, which is, you know, it's really exciting to see, and yeah, it's gonna be good. Onwards and upwards. Yeah. Hey, thanks very much no, for the time, it. mate. Yeah, I appreciate you. Oh, no problem. Very interesting, <laughs> man. Interesting, because <laughs> people don't know, you know, they just see faces at the fights yeah. and things like yeah, that, yeah, and yeah, yeah. don't know the backgrounds and no. things like that. I, I can always remember, like, as I say, when I was a kid, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and yeah. like, so I, I followed your dad. Yeah, every, every magazine had, um, you could buy yeah, yeah. Um, weight yeah. gear, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he Charles put, Atlas, and, he and put it right up. yeah, yeah, he put it right up. yeah. He's done a great job with it. I, I liked the weights, but I didn't think there was a future in it. I could see, you know, okay, as long as you can count to 10, there's these guys coming in and, and claiming to be experts, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. I want a real skill set that I can hand down, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And I just thought, well, martial arts the way to do that. That's a real skill set that I can <coughs> acquire and then hand that down to my kids, you know? Yeah. Um, well, people that think that they're uh, martial arts trainers, they, oh. they, they soon found out, you know? Well, they... they I don't know, are they? Because, you know, as long as they can talk a big game, you know, they get the, you know, the white belt coming in off the street and they just believe the, uh, their smoke yeah. and mirrors, you know. Um, it's disappointing the way the sport's gone, you know. Um, when I got my black belt, it was 17 years of hard graft and I knew when I got my black belt, I could fight anyone in the world and, and, <coughs> and hold my own, you know. I mean, I might not win everything, you know, but I de definitely know every situation, every scenario that I can get in, I know an answer, yeah. you know. And these days, man, the, the hand in the black belt's out. And I'm seeing, you know, at least be in shape, boys. You know, I mean, if you're yeah. going to get a black belt, at least be fit, yeah. please. You know what I mean? Like, they're putting their black belts, tying their black belts, and they've got to lift their guts to get it under the belt, mate. Yeah. You know, it's just a disgrace, yeah. you know, it really is. Yeah. You know, I mean, this should be the best, <coughs> you should be in the best shape of your life when you go over the line for black. You know, there's no excuses there. Technically, okay, whatever, we're, we're far away from it and these guys aren't, you know, in a financial situation to really be at a high, high level, but at least be fit, please, yeah. you know. That's <laughs> 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 a disgrace, eh, what I've seen, yeah. man, but um, bit, yeah. yeah. That's it, man. That's the that's the way it goes, you know. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I think um, MMA is such a new sport too. There was a lot of people who thought they'd just transition from one thing without yeah. having never done yeah. any any of the others, you yeah. know. And, and um, well, I mean, you know, uh, if your takedowns are, are world class, the better your takedowns are, the less hands you need. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if your takedowns aren't sharp, you better know how to throw hands. Yeah. You know, yeah. because you're going to be up there for a while. You know. And I see the new, the modern day jujitsu guys. None of them know how to do any takedowns. So there'll be a world-class talent in jiu-jitsu. They'll try and move over to MMA and just get absolutely murdered, you know? And, you know, man, it's just, it's just a bit disappointing the way the sport's gone as far as jiu-jitsu with pulling guard and that. I just think it's... So you're, you're sticking to the more traditional styles, the way you come through? Yeah, I mean, takedowns, man. Battle for the takedown, yeah. you know? Like, that's... That's I went, why I joined martial arts was because I wanted to know how to look after myself on the street. That's what everyone does. No one joins martial arts to be the best jiu-jitsu practitioner in the world. They join martial arts because they want to know how to look after themselves. And pulling guard is just det to, uh, detrimental to, to your safety, you know what I mean, on the street, you know, seriously. Uh, I think it, you know, and the way martial arts is, you know, the way society's going now, um, my boys are going out there and coming back with the reports about getting pulled knives on them weekly. So we're really upping our self-defense angle here. Yeah. You know, I mean, just because you know how to fight doesn't mean you know how to defend yourself against a knife in a real situation. Yeah. So we're really up in our game as far as weapon defense and self-defense, uh, just to be responsible, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think it's our duty to prepare these kids for what could potentially unfold out there, you know. It's a sad, sad world, but, you know, uh, we've got yeah, to prepare crazy. for it. It's, it's long gone, the old one-on-one, -on -one and everybody stands around, they, you get up yeah. off the ground, shake hands. No, and cowards. Buy a beer. Absolutely yeah. cowards, mate, yeah. you know. It really is, it's just a disgrace, but we can't... Uh, you know, get upset and say it's never going to happen and not prepare. We've got yeah. to prepare for the worst case scenario, you know. That's what we are. That's a, we're a martial arts club. If we can't, if we're not doing it, you know, it's, it yeah, that's right, you know. Yeah. So I've got a good friend that goes to Israel quite regularly and up, up, he's um, just got received his black belt, you know, in Krav Maga over there and it's, it's honest, you know, it's real as far as the weaponry side of things go. Yeah. <coughs> So I don't think you can beat jiu-jitsu as far as positional, yeah. you know, but um, entries and, and weapons, I think Krav Maga have got a, you know, a good in, insight into that. So we're engaging with him and doing a lot of uh, workshops and stuff like that on, you know, the self-defense side of things. Yeah. And it's complete martial art then, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that's what it is, we're mixed martial arts. I mean, we just take the best of whatever works, you know. That's what jiu-jitsu's been renowned for in the past, you know, is uh, just taking the best technique, doesn't matter what it looks like, if it's effective, we use it, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And we've taken that, you know, right through self-defense into, you know, the street stuff and trying to stay true to that sort of philosophy, you know. Mm. So what we were trying to do here is merge and, and try and inspire the youth, you know, so we have high performance camps where we really drop the asset on the boys, you know, over two or three days. We put them into the Navy SEALs mud run and we, you know, we, we really drop and, and they do a lot of uh, just rolling, you know, like mat time. So we bring the kids in in the last two or three hours on the Sunday and they can see, you know, what these guys are doing, you know, and it just opens their horizons and, and, and pushes their boundaries, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, kids that come in that are, you know, stand out, so I try and get them to engage in, in uh, assistant coaches, you know, and in our last staff dinner at Christmas, we invited like three or four of the kids that had been engaging on their own, you know, in their own uh, steam to come along to the staff dinner, you know, and they thought they were just the bees yeah. and knees, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and that just matures them and, you know, inspires them to take it to the next level. And it's just a, you know, yeah, a bit of a mentoring program, you know. It's, um, no, nah, it's exciting, mate. It really is, eh, you know.
good philosophy. Yeah. yeah, it's just, man, the kids are just left to their own devices yeah. these days, man. There's just so many talents out there being wasted, staring down, getting a crank neck, looking at their yeah. devices, yeah. you know, and they're just devolving, mate. You know, we're devolving, we're feeding them shit food. I mean, they're looking at the device. Mum and Dad are so busy now paying bills, they haven't got time for them. So if they make a noise, they throw some more chippies or some food toxic crap at them, you know, and then they don't train, they don't do any exercise. So, man, it's, you know, I read an article where it's saying that our kids are the first generation that there's going to be a, a lot of them die before we do, you know, yeah. because we grew up clean air, running around, eating, you know, eating Food solid meals. Yeah, yeah, not now, mate. Yeah. It's chippies and coke and yeah. energy drinks and, yeah. you know, no, no physical, you know, stress to, you know, to make them strong and they're just going to fall over. They haven't got a base, you know. I'm just reading this book on David Goggins. I don't know if you read it. Have it, get it out, mate. David Goggins, it's his life story. It's called You Can't Hurt Me. And you can get it on audio books, so you just plug it in and, and it plays in the, t in the, in the car. And, and he's just saying, he's a Navy SEAL, he's gone through Hell Week three times, now he's an enduro athlete. You know, they run, uh, they swim, these enduro Ironmans, they swim eight miles, they bike ride like 400 kil kilometres, and then they get off the bike and they do two marathons. And this guy, you know, I mean, you know, fighters stay in, in the hole. We, we go through hell, there's no two ways about it, but we only stay in there for maybe... 20 to 30 minutes and then we're so busy thinking about solving equations that we can't really uh, tap you know think through the process and this guy spends hours days he does 24 hour races so he's in the hole he's fighting his mind for up to you know 12 14 hours so he's systemized ways to dig deep and to get more out of the human psyche and he was just saying that, you know, th this philosophy of everyone wins, you know, you know, medals for participation and all that. He says, mate, what you're doing is you're making everyone, we're not all winning, we're all losing. You know, he says there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a process he calls the cookie jar, you know, and, he, and, and every time you overcome a hard situation, you put a cookie, like a, a, a good thought, into the jar, you know. And when you're under hard times, you dig into the cookie jar and regurgitate that memory. And that's what's able to drive you to push harder and to go longer. You can think, man, that's what Hell Week is in the Navy SEALs. That's what we do here, high performance. Gives you a cushion to think, man, it was, this is pretty tough, but it wasn't as tough as that. Yeah. You know, but the, what he's saying is now this younger generation, they're reaching into the cookie jar, there's nothing there, mate. Yeah, that's real use. Nothing, there's no, <laughs> they haven't overcome anything. No, yeah. They've been kept in a bubble, you know, it's like, and then what they're doing is they're reaching for a rope and killing themselves, mate. They can't deal with it. You know, really our parenting system, I mean, all, we're doing, all we are as parents is coaches. And, you know, uh, or, you know me as a coach here, I'd, I'd love to go around the gym and just throw black belts to all my friends. You know, I'd love it, but they're not. Yeah. I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm actually putting them in harm's way if I do that, you know. Yeah. I put them into a tournament as a black belt, they're going to get murdered. So what I do is I just slowly increase their workload or their, you know, their problem solving, make it slowly and slowly, slowly harder, okay? Now you can problem solve to this level, you're a blue belt. Still, you know, but I'm always a safety net, you know? You're always a safety net to say, hey, that's too much, you know, and, and the tap is a big one in jujitsu, you know? But the coach is always there to help people if they get stuck. And you're always just upping the load, upping the load, up until one day, you can say, man, you can handle anything, you're a black belt, you know what I mean? Yeah. Put them in a black belt com competition, they're gonna do well. But us as parents, we're keeping our kids white belts, man. We're keeping them in a bubble, not exposing them to anything, and then we're just releasing them into a, into a world which is, you know, toxic. well, a yeah, toxic environment, which is basically a black belt tournament. Yeah. And you're putting white belts in a black belt tournament, man. They're getting murdered out there, and these kids are coming back. I can't deal in him and hanging themselves. We've got an epidemic of suicide, man. I'll tell you what, failed parenting techniques, are, I think, are a massive part of it, you know? We're not doing our jobs, man. Yeah. Since I've been filming and that, and the, the people that get ahead are the ones that are challenged all the time. Yes. You know, like Philip Lamb would 
Chuckers boys yeah. adapts the overseas, yeah. overseas, overseas. You got it, and, man. You and that's to, where you got the Choppers and the Jason Suddies and, get the and those guys from. You know, you got to give them the opportunity. Yeah. You know, you know, I started back in the back in my day, looking after my guys and training them right up, and then yeah, yeah and then and then you know then releasing them out into the wild later on. But half the, then I realised that, man, that guy doesn't even want to fight. He copped one in the face and he didn't enjoy it. And he's gone now. Yeah. I've just poured three years down the toilet. Yeah. You know, now I'm more likely to train them. If they look good, I'll put a bit of attention into them for a f five, six months, then jump in. Yeah. If you like it, man, now we're away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you, yeah. you know, I've got to test but, it. But you went and tested yourself. Like yeah. by going, say, and leaving, probably, you know, you, you could have had things set up for yeah. you from with the family business yeah. and everything you challenged yourself and went overseas yeah 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 um, i mean yeah that's right man i mean i i remember getting dropped i got picked up and fully dropped on my hip in training one time by this uh, olympic champion judo guy you know and it was like above his head mate this was pole axed onto the ground you know and uh in training and i got a hematoma the size of a football like a rugby ball come up on my hip and uh they like this. oh they did they had pretty good mats but it just was just a pretty yeah. pretty epic throw and uh my hip didn't cop it and it blew out and uh it went bad and i went in i used henry's uh, s services card and got surgery and drained it you know and this thing was huge man and they put so much gauze in there and then i was staying at a, at that time i was staying at a backpackers and I went in there and went to train and keep watching training and then come home. And then one night I it was you know it was healing and I ripped the I just scratched it and ripped the gauze off and then pulled half the half the gauze out you know. And then I looked because there was a bit of moonlight. I looked and there was just blood everywhere, man. So I just packed the gauze back in my ass and then rolled over and slept on it. I was like I'll deal with that shit in the morning, you know. And then I got up in the morning. I had to wait until everyone was gone, mate. And I pulled the blankets off. It just looked like something out of Hellraiser, right? There was just blood up. Like, how I didn't bleed to death, I don't know. And uh, so I just checked out, you know. <laughs> had a shower and checked out and flipped the mattress over and I was out of there, mate. It must have looked like there was an actual murder there, eh? The amount of blood, eh? But yeah, there's no one to bail you out, mate. You just keep walking forward, man. That's it, you know. You're in there by yourself and you've got to get it done, eh? Yeah. <laughs> but they're the best times of your life. And that's yeah. that, what he was talking about, getting cook cookies, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, And yeah. just like, man, I've been here before. I yeah. can do this, you know? Yeah. Hey, uh, you would have been happy on Sunday seeing JJ. Oh, oh yeah. Eh? No, he's, a, he's a good kid, mate. That kid, that kid came to me, the story of JJ, he came to me. Uh, one of his mates wanted to come and do a class, and back then I used to do just a free, first class free. He said, come and do this class, man. Jay's like, no way, I don't want to be going there, you know? And he says, I'll buy you a bag of lollies, bro, if you come. Jay goes, okay, count me in, you know? Comes, this guy disappears, and now JJ's in, in, in San Diego, you know? He, I mean, JJ was basically homeless, you know? Yeah, yeah. He lived in my attic in the gym for, uh, for two years, you know? And, um, just a great kid, you know, and uh, he just started to perform. I mean, oh, we were looking after him before he was anything, you know. He just needed a place to stay, so we put him in up there, and um, then he started to turn up to tournaments and do well, you know. I was like, man, this kid, you know, doing all right. And then he just really dug deep, and, 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 and you know, then we sent him overseas, and he got a, you know, a little bit of confidence, and he's away. Yeah. And now look at him in Bellator, you know. Two, you know, two first two wins in under under two minutes. Yeah. He's just getting it done, man. Yeah. But it's exciting, eh? Yeah. You know, Definitely. New Zealand's carving up in the MMA at the moment yeah. in the world yeah. world yeah. scene. You know, we got Izzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, Izzy's doing a great job, man. I think he, I think he's the good. You know, yeah. honestly, he's he's a special talent. He's super calm. He's got reach for weeks. His yeah. timing is uh, is perfect. And, and you know, I, I I put money on him over. Anderson, yeah. you know, Anderson's been unactive, he hasn't been around, he's definitely a highly, highly skilled player, but he's, you know, as he's been in there, you know, numerous yeah. times, he's sharp, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I think as he's got a bright future, man, he really has, yeah. you know. Yeah. No, it's looking good, all right. Yeah, it is, mate, it's, I mean, you know, any time the New Zealanders um, do well, you know, it's good for the whole country. Well, you know. it is, you know, yeah. it, it, 
you know, kids see that and they want to train. So yeah, go somewhere, that's so, right. You know, so yeah, that's right. Ho hopefully it'll be a big boost to um, numbers right throughout. Yeah. The, the no, it's exciting, man. Yeah. It really is. No.